Good day, friends. How I wish I could have joined you in person for the morning service at First Presbyterian Ferguson. Unfortunately, my garage door decided to malfunction, no doubt due to the frigid temperatures we're having in St. Louis. So my car was stuck in the garage and I was stuck at home. But as Jan noted, you always have a plan B. And for me, that means recording this message and making it available on the church Facebook page. Mike has taken a well-deserved Sunday off and asked me to fill in for him, an opportunity I gladly accepted. For those of you whom I have not yet met, I am Barbara Boyer, a ruling elder at Second Presbyterian Church, St. Louis. By way of background, my initial introduction to First Pres Ferguson came in October 2018 when I began a six-month internship as part of the Commission Pastors Program offered by the Presbytery. First Pres, you will always have a warm spot in my heart for your support before, during, and after that internship. Before beginning the service, I would like to offer my belated congratulations on the 150th anniversary of First in Ferguson. What a milestone and what a testimony to the faithfulness of this congregation across the generations. I pray that you enjoy many more decades of sharing the love of Christ with each other and with your community. Blessings to all of you. It is good to be with you once again. This morning's meditation comes to us from Howard Thurman, an African-American theologian, educator, and civil rights leader. A prominent religious figure, he played a leading role in many social justice movements and organizations of the 20th century. Thurman's theology of radical nonviolence influenced and shaped a generation of civil rights activists and he was a key mentor to leaders within the civil rights movement, including the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The following meditation, Take No Thought for Your Life, is from Thurman's Meditations of the Heart, first published in 1953. He writes, Take no thought. This day, I shall desert my anxieties. I shall forsake them, cut them off from the food supply of my spirit. Confident am I that if I do not feed them, they cannot long survive. I shall seek to limit my primary exposure to those who exploit my anxieties by their tendency to exaggeration and alarm. I shall seek to broaden my exposure to those whose lives give forth confidence and calmness. Into God's hand do I yield myself this day, with all that it involves for me, with the faith that I can take complete refuge in the knowledge and the love of God. For me, this will not be easy, nor do I lightly undertake it. Take no thought for your life. What a strange thing it is, this injunction. Up to this period of my life, I have seemed to survive by taking thought for my life. Upon deeper reflection, I begin to see that my life is not now, nor has it ever been my own. I did not create, nor have I sustained my life through the years. In so many ways, without my own plans and purposes, Hard places have been made soft and rough places smooth. It is a source of immeasurable satisfaction and comfort to me to know that God, who is the source and sustainer of life, can be trusted to see me all the way to the end and beyond. Take no thought for your life. It is in God's hands, and ever when I am obeying the laws of life, it is God who works through me. Take no thought for your life. Amen. Valentine's Day, President's Day, Fat Tuesday, Chinese New Year. 
These are just some of the many ways we celebrate this month. There's also National Don't Cry Over Spilled Milk Day, National Tortellini Day, Ice Cream for Breakfast Day, and National Homemade Soup Day, to name but a few. But there's one day in February that seems especially germane to today's Bible passages, National Signing Day, which occurs on the first Wednesday in February. That's the day when a high school football recruit can commit to the college of his choice. Over the years, this day has become an even grander affair, with some of the most talented players announcing their decisions in front of television cameras and their entire school. That day is the culmination of months or years of the building of relationships between college coaches and high school players and their coaches. Recruits visit college campuses and meet with the coaches. Coaches call athletes, visit with them in their homes to meet their parents, and study film, trying to spot the athletes that will ensure their program's victory on Saturday afternoons. It's a long process, which makes today's story of Jesus calling his disciples even more remarkable. Listen again to the story from Mark 1. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. And from Matthew 4, going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Where's the long recruiting pitch and the tour of the campus? The meetings between potential recruit and coach Jesus? How can Jesus study game film when these men had never played a minute as a disciple? Was this National Signing Day even written about in the Galilee Gazette? Just what was it that Jesus saw in these first disciples? And why fishermen of all people? Surely there were other men of more educated professions than fishermen in that area. Lawyers, merchants, politicians. Yet he chose fishermen. Many of us might think that Jesus would have selected the brightest minds of the synagogues to be his disciples. However, that wasn't the case. He turned away from the synagogue. He walked down to the beach. He walked down to where the people were and where they were working hard. He went to the blue-collar people and he showed them that we don't have to be smart. We don't have to be rich. We must simply decide to answer the call and sign on to a life devoted to Jesus. But what traits did these fishermen possess that made Jesus decide they were fitting for discipleship? A reliance on God's providence was central to Christ's decision, no doubt. But I would offer there were other characteristics of fishermen that made them ideal disciples. What were those traits and how might they apply to each of us? First, fishing requires a great deal of patience and dedication. Fishermen might go hours, perhaps days, without even a nibble. Giving up is not an option if one is to sustain his livelihood. A fisherman's dedication pushes him to keep fishing. Fishermen must also be patient. Sometimes they spend hours catching nothing. A fisherman realizes that the amount of work and preparation he puts into making his catch does not always match up to what he brings in. Likewise, we often fish for souls for long periods of time and leave having only baited the hook. A second characteristic that no doubt Jesus saw in the fishermen, those who fish for a living are courageous. Fishing can require a person to travel into deep and treacherous waters. In fact, it was common in Jesus' day for fishermen to be caught in fierce storms while on the open sea. 
It was their courage which pushed them to go back into the water after experiencing one of these storms. Vincent van Gogh observed, the fishermen know that the sea is dangerous and the storm terrible, but they have never found these dangers sufficient reason for remaining ashore. Believers need such courage when witnessing and need to be willing to step out of their comfort zones and go back in to the deep waves. There are any number of circumstances that could cripple us with fear, but we must continue the journey of life. This takes courage. And Jesus knew that what the journey he was about to take with these disciples would require tremendous courage. Next, a successful fisherman needs to be in tune to all the happenings of the weather. Fishermen are experts in knowing the temperature, wind, and water. Because of this attentiveness, they learn and develop techniques that enable them to make their catch of the day. Alert and skillful, they are always ready to set the hook, just as we should be ready with an answer for those we are trying to hook for Christ. Finally, fishermen understand what it means to rely on God. Leslie Leyland Fields, a writer, editor, and national speaker who has a background in commercial fishing, notes, quote, Fishermen are like farmers. They're completely dependent on the providence of God. We can buy the best nets that we can find. We can keep them mended. We can know where to put our nets. We can have all this human knowledge. But unless God sends the fish, we're not going to catch anything. So every time we throw our nets into the water, and every time the disciples threw their nets in the water, it's kind of like a prayer. It's like saying, give us this day our daily bread. It's a supplication to God. Lord, feed us. The call story. Ordinary men called to live extraordinary lives because Jesus saw in them what they could not see in themselves. Courage, dedication, perseverance. As we read in the story, the men are working. They are living out their lives as fishermen, providing food for their community and families. Their work is necessary and useful. But God's call changes all that. He comes to them and says, Follow me. I won't make you better fishermen. Instead, I'll give you a new purpose. You will serve my kingdom and you will fish for people. He calls them to be his disciples. He does no less to each of us. So how are we called to be fishers of people? Being fishers of people is to share the gospel with friends, neighbors, and strangers, and pray they answer the call while being patient. Rarely does acceptance of Christ's call happen as though a lightning bolt from heaven. Rather, it occurs over the course of months or years. That was certainly the case for me. I grew up unchurched, but was blessed to meet many fishers of people who modeled the love of God. It was through their collective discipleship that I came to know Christ. I will admit, being fishers of people is easier with those whom we share an ongoing relationship. But being fishers of people is also being willing to build bridges with those with whom we disagree. Being fishers of people is lifting up those who have been marginalized and being aware of our own prejudices. Being fishers of people is seeking reconciliation. There is currently anger or distrust. These things are not easy. If it were, our nation and our world wouldn't be so divided. There wouldn't be so much fear. There wouldn't be so much hatred. To be fishers of people is a difficult calling. It is a calling to seek relationships with Jesus and with others. And it is a calling to begin to see Jesus in others. And perhaps that is where we must start, to work on the relationships closest to us and to work on our relationship with Christ. As we get to know him better and discover how he interacted with, with and related to the people around him, we can emulate these types of relationships in our own lives. It takes an effort, but it is worth it. Like Simon and Andrew, like James and John, we are called to be fishers of people. God has chosen each one of us to serve one another. Uncertainty and doubt are sure to enter, but at such times, 
we would be well to remember the words of Howard Thurman. Take no thought for your life. It is in God's hands and ever when I'm obeying the laws of life, it is God who works through me. Take no thought for your life. May it be true for each of us this day. Amen.